OK, can everybody hear me? Yes? Good. OK, we're starting a little late, but that's OK. We'll, it's, we'll go relatively fast um, so we can finish hopefully on time. Uh, my name's Jorik. I work for ISIO. We basically do medical workflow tracking real-time software as a web app, both on desktop and on mobile. So this is like a quick overview of a whole bunch of stuff that we've found out over the last two years. OK? So one of the key things about talk about uh, JavaScript persistence is basically getting your code and your data to the device and keeping it there. So first you've got to download it, you've got to keep it there, and then when you change it or you update it, you've got a bug fix, is the case of actually then getting the new version there in a timely manner. So problems that we have on mobiles, we all know, we have slow networking speeds. And we have really bad latency problems, particularly in medical facilities where we work, we have really bad latency problems and really bad Wi-Fi setups because they're set up for medical facilities and Wi-Fi is a kind of like an afterthought. So, um, so you've got the bad latency and then also you also have problems with you download the code to the browser and then the browser redownloads it, it doesn't keep it around, whereas because it keeping around for you is basically under its control, not your control. So really, you want to have more control over how you download stuff. One of the things I'll be talking about briefly is what's known as the, the cache freshness trade-off, which is you want to download your stuff, you want it to stay there on the device, but you want to be able to update it, OK? So here is the number one easy solution to solve all these problems, OK? That's like use PhoneGap, wrap all your data, all your code, put it in an app, download it once, use this device, it's always going to be there. They never have to download it again. We're done. Of course, if life was that easy, there wouldn't be problems with that solution. <laughs> so problems with that solution are, yeah, you've got to build a you know, Condova app for iOS and Android and Amazon. And you know, you, the list goes on, you know, and you know, mobile windows and stuff. Other problems on uh, iOS, when you're running your JavaScript, it's not using the, the, the JIT compiler. New version of iOS 8 looks like we're going to be able to do that with PhoneGap, but today it doesn't, so your JavaScript runs somewhat slower. If you're running on Android, unless you're running like the really latest version, the web view there is not Chrome. It's like Chrome, it's sort of Chrome, but it's Android and it's not quite Chrome. And so your code is not quite the same. And of course, you build all this stuff for Cadova and you still want your desktop version to maintain. So you're building two sets, or your Cadova apps, and your desktop version, so. More flaws, by the way, is you now have a bug fix. You do a new build with Cadova, you wrap up your application, you submit it to Android, you submit it to Google, you submit it to Apple, and it's like, yeah, then you wait weeks, you've got this like critical bug, and you can't get it to the users fast enough. And you're also dependent on the users actually updating. And they don't always update. You can't force them to update their application to re-download the new version. So, Let's see if we can come up with a better solution. A better solution where you always get to use the native browser on the device. You can download your code as fast as you can. Things is not, you know, you keep it there for as long as you can. And if there's an update, you can update it as immediately as you can. And if all things go to plan and your application doesn't actually need any network connectivity, you can actually build it so that you can work totally offline with all your code and all your data and everything you need. So before I go into that, just a quick point is the fact that if we're going to talk a lot about downloading code, caching code, keeping it there, and the techniques used, you've got to learn how to use the debugging tools in the browser. There's lots of tools there for tracking your downloads, seeing what you've got downloaded, whether it's being re-downloaded, so you can quite easily go and inspect all those headers, what the state of the world is. Okay? So first thing, we've got to get your data to the phone or the mobile device fast. So smaller the data, the better. So minimize your files. Get them small. Other thing you can do is things, JavaScript is really fast on you know, most mobile devices nowadays. So instead of generating a huge amount of HTML for your page, just generate a small container of HTML and download the actual data that you're going to be representing on that page, and then use the JavaScript to actually build the DOM for you. Don't you know, generate and download 40Ks worth of HTML tags for, you know, half a k's worth of data. Other thing you can do is if you configure your server right, you can compress all your downloads as well. Most servers do this, but it's the thing to check 
and you can check in your headers, in the debugger, is, that, are you really down, is your downloads really compressed? Because all this stuff's text, it compresses really well. The other thing you can do is, the faster you can get it to the device, is the closer your server is to the user. So, if you're not already using a CDN to host all your data, really seriously think about using one. If I'm sitting you know, on the west coast here and our server is in Chicago, which is actually where it is, it's 800 millisecond round trip. It should be 50 millisecond round trip because that's distance from here to San Jose. And you can do that for all your static data. You can't do it for your dynamic data, but most of your pages, static data, all your JavaScript, it's all static. All your images, they're all static. So here's a bunch of CDNs. You can Google around. There's a ton of them out there. We personally use Cloudflare because they have like 23 places around the world. Um, but you know, there's a whole bunch of them, depending on what your needs are. Seriously consider using a CDN. The other good reasons for using a CDN are on the fly, they will automatically minimize your files for you. So you don't have to go through all the crap of minimizing your files every time you do a new build. Go minimize all your files. Don't do that. Let the CDN handle that on the fly. First time they pull the file, new version from your server, they'll cache it, they'll minimize it, and then they'll serve that to the user. They'll automatically do the, de the compression for you, the Z compression. They'll automatically com cache it at like, you know, probably a location much nearer to your user than your server is. And of course, they do a redundancy of servers, so if one of them goes down, they automatically redirect traffic to the next nearest one to your user. And the basic level of service for this is free. Professional level services gets more expensive, but not that expensive. I actually pay $200 a month for our CDN usage. So we've now got the data to the user's machine. How are we doing on time? OK, I'm doing fine. There's several places we can store it. We can store your, your data, store your JavaScript. We can be dependent on the browser to kind of cache it for you, and it will do a reasonably good job for you. Or you could use local storage and store it yourself. Or you could use the app cache and let that store it for you. So let's go over them. Browser cache, it'll cache anything. It'll cache any file, code, CSS, images, whatever you like. And when you update them on the server, they're kind of automatic-ish, ish, <laughs> automatic-ish as to you know, whether they'll get downloaded or not. It depends on how you set up your headers. Two ways of doing it. You can do an expiration, say, OK, I'm going to say, my JavaScript's probably not going to change for another seven days, so I'll set a seven-day header, which is great until you actually have a bug to fix tomorrow. So <laughs> you can't do that, yeah, because the browser's not going to update it. Or you can go for the model of saying, hey, browser, um, please check as if I've modified the file, you know, what's known as the last modified check, and it will do it for you quite happily except for the fact that because of the latency problem, that's a very slow check. And if your page has lots of images and lots of JavaScript and lots of files, it's going to slow down the rendering while it does all those checks. You won't notice it on the desktop on the fast network, but you'll notice it on mobile. So the key thing to know is how often do you need to update your code? If you want to be responsive and you say, oh, if the user, if there's a critical bug, I need to fix it tonight then you can't have a long cache timeout. If you're not that fast, then you can. Because once it's there, it's going to stay there, and the browser's really not going to ask for a new version unless you really force it. So the key is you'll probably end up downloading the code. More, if you just use the browser cache, downloading the code more often than you need. And you can't really control this. Different browsers, Chrome, IE, Firefox, they all have their kind of algorithms as to try to work out how to check and how to download new versions of the page based on the headers that you send them. So, and some people say, okay, well, that's really easy. I'm gonna set a long time out of like, say, 30 days, and if I really need to do that hot fix, I'll just rename the file, I'll give it another name. And then everywhere I refer to that file in the code, I'll change that and all, all the pages. And then the browser will not have seen that file, and it will go download it. And I say, I think everybody has better things to do than renaming files and updating code everywhere to, for the new renamed file. <laughs> you know, There's ways to get better control. 
One thing to watch out for is that if in your application um, you need to reload the page, or if something happens, you need to refresh the page. The standard way of doing that is you say, you know, window location reload. That's straight JavaScript that says reload the page. If you do that, most modern browsers will go and do a last modified check on every single item on that page. They'll go check, send off a request to the server saying, hey, has this image file changed? Has this JavaScript file? Has this jQuery library changed? Every single file. So if you really need to reload a page, basically set your URL to be yourself. It's a magic little trick. If you set your URL to where you currently are, all that happens is it goes and fetches it from the cache in the browser. So if you need to re-render the page, all these slides will be, I, I put a reference to the slides at the beginning of the talk, and there'll be the same reference at the end of the talk, so they're all available. Um, so that's just a neat little trick if you, you, know, you have a refresh page on, on, or something. If you use the standard reload, it'll go re-download or re-go check all your images as well, not just your dynamic data. So, moving on, local storage. M most modern browsers, I think, yeah, IE9 and on, and Chrome, and everybody has local storage. And so you can store anything in it as long as it's a string. You can store code, you can store data. If there's like data you download, the app has, say, you know, you have some app that, you know, say you're doing some app for Subway and they have weekly specials once a month, which is what they do on their app. Every time you go to the web page, there's not a lot of point in downloading all those specials every single time. You just say, hey, is, you know, is it past the first of the month? Let's download this month's specials. And they're there on the, in the user's browser. And we can store that information and use it. You don't have to keep downloading it from the, the server every time. So the thing about local storage is any string. Arbitrary string, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be CSS. It can be JavaScript. It can be JSON data. It doesn't really matter. As long as you can represent it as a string, you can store it on, in the browser. The key thing about it is the local storage is assigned on a domain by domain basis. So you associate the data that you store, that you download to the browser, and you store it against a particular domain, just kind of like cookies, only you've got much more data. And once it's downloaded, it just stays there. It doesn't go anywhere, unlike cookies that get resent back up to the server. How you update the local storage is, and when you update it is up to you. So if you wanted, you could download all your JavaScript, store it in local storage, and then each time your page loads for the first time, you can say, hey, server, when, was, when did I last do a code release? And if it's newer than what you saved before, you just download the new code. And if not, don't. You know, whereas normally, you'd be downloading all your JavaScript every, you know, every time the user goes away, comes back tomorrow. And with local storage, you can quit the browser, come back, it'll still be there. It, it doesn't go away. So, as I said, now, there is in theory a five megabyte limit on what you can store in local storage on a per domain basis. I have a very big web app. I don't have five megabytes of minimized JavaScript to store. So, five megabytes of minimized JavaScript is a lot of code. <laughs> or a lot of data, you know. So, as I said, you update it when you want. It's good for code, good for CSS, not good for images because you can only store strings and you'd have to represent, you have to, you know, base64 them or something crazy. So, don't do that. Here's a quick little snapshot, which you can look at the slides later. But basically, this says, okay, I'm going to go find all my script tags and then I'm going to make a unique name from the script tag for the path and then I'm going to go do an Ajax call go get them, and then this, and then going to store them in local storage. So that's an easy way that you could say, on my page, I'm going to go get all the code that I need for next time this page loads. I'll leave it as an exercise to somebody else as to how you take that code and go put it back in the DOM, but it's pretty straightforward. You know, worst case scenario, you could use eval. <laughs> Wouldn't necessarily recommend using eval, but you could. It's easy enough to go create a script tag in the DOM and go put it back in there. So, next up, before I run out of time, app cache. App cache is kind of like local storage, except for the fact that as we're back to the, like the browser cache, we're storing files. We're not storing arbitrary data that you control. 
So, be, so you can store JavaScript, CSS images, HTML, any, any file you like. And the key with that cache is that basically, once you've downloaded it, when your page loads, it makes a one check to the server saying, has anything in my, you have this manifest file, which we're about to get to, has anything in the manifest changed? And it's an either all or nothing. It's like, if it's changed, it then re-downloads everything. If it's not changed, it re-downloads nothing. So this is an easy way to say, all my images, CSS, I'll download them once, <coughs> and they'll stay there, and I'll never download them again. And with this, you can actually work offline. And if there's newer versions, when it, if, if the last modified check fails because there's no network there, it'll use the versions in the cache. And if it succeeds and there's a network there, it'll download new versions if necessary. So a manifest file looks like this. You change your HTML tag to say HTML, manifest, and you give it a name of a file. And in the file, you literally list all the URLs that you want stored in the browser's application cache. And they don't even have to be local to your domain. They could be anywhere. You can, you know, you can put you know, third-party libraries hosted off Google, CDN, or whatever, anything you like. If it's a relative path, great. If it's you know, a full HTTP address, works just great. You can store anything you like. So doing the updates, you kind of control this one. You kind of control it by just mod changing the modified date of your, of your manifest file. You change the modification date, that's it. Everything in that file gets re-downloaded. So you have lots of control. You can say, because you literally just say, download the files, don't download them again, and then when you need to do, do that critical fix, you upload new versions of the server, you change the modification date on your manifest file, and the users will see it straight away. It saves all this like last modified check on every single file, so it just does it just the once. If you want to know more about AppCache, here's a bunch of references. Uh, the re first one's really good introduction as to all the details. The second one is absolutely definitely worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> Application cache is a douchebag. Um, it's definitely worth reading because, like anything, it does sound too good to be true. There is some gotchas. So that article goes over the gotchas in much more detail than I could ever do. So definitely read that one. And if you're really into it, you can read the spec. <laughs> so earlier today, there was a really good talk, actually, by, by Jeff from, from Microsoft on Behold the Power of the Web App Manifest, which is actually more a different type of manifest, but it's all to do with building web apps. Uh, unfortunately, it was before mine, so I can't say go watch it. But when they do put the video up there, go watch it, because it, it goes over a lot of detail on web, web app manifests. So, in summary, putting it all together, use a CDN, get the data to the user as fast as possible. They'll do lots of good stuff for you. If you have static data or static CSS and code and you really want to have control over it and you want to do the legwork, use local storage. As it happens, I didn't touch session storage, but session storage is kind of like server sessions on a server, but it's just local to the browser. So if you have information you want to carry from page to page to page, you can just store it in session storage. It's the same kind of thing, any arbitrary string. It's easy enough to go look it up. And if you really just want to stash a whole bunch of files and never download them again, use app cache. <coughs> and if you get it all right together, you can actually write an app using you know, pure HTML5 and JavaScript that sits on your mobile device and does everything. You know, write games, write spreadsheets, write word processors. You know until you need to actually save that document. Well, you can save the document in local storage, and then when you get the network connection back, you can upload it, you know. You can, can go to totally offline. You just gotta get it there once. And just an example, if you go look in the debugger tools at the Google homepage, you'll find they're storing 250 kilobytes in your application cache of all their JavaScript to run <laughs> that homepage. They download it once. They stuff it in the application cache. 250K's worth of it in about six different JavaScript files. So they do that. So the end philosophy should be, you should be under, up, the control of the updates should be under your control. I don't just depend on, oh, well, the browser will update it if I put a new version on the server. Yes, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Yeah, maybe you'll get lucky. Be more proactive. 
you can use local storage, you can use app cache to make things much better experience for the user. Okay, and I'm finished on time, even though I started late. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>